Yeah, so my name is John Robson. Um, I should at this point point out that I'm from the University of Reading. Everyone always thinks I work for the Met Office. Um, and uh, so this is work we've been doing. Uh, we've, um, yeah, so mainly I'm going to talk about this uh, new decadal prediction system uh, based on the hygiene model. I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, it involves uh, a bunch of people that many of you may recognize from Reading, so Dan Hodgson, Len Shaffrey, Ed Hawkins, and Rowan Sutton. Some other people, Dave Siemens at UEA, <laughs> Doug was involved as well. Uh, and so basically, this all came about. So at CMIT 5, the Met Office was still using HADCM3. We saw an opportunity to kind of have a high resolution model. Um, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, I'll let you uh, decide whether you think it was uh, later. But this was all, all fully unfunded, all done in our spare time, uh, just because we love decadal prediction so much, basically. Um, <laughs> I, only, I also only read the agenda on Friday, so I only realized then that I was in the volcano section. So after doing some quick plots at the weekend, I've got some initial plots on, the, on some new volcano runs as well. So uh, yeah, hopefully you bear with me. Uh, so yeah, so what's the observation? Uh, the observation is the motivation is, is as always, is it? So this is, uh, Doug showed this plot the other day in his, uh, uh, in his public lecture, and this is skill in uh, one of the previous versions of the Met Office system relative to the uninitialized I didn't put what this is, but this is years uh, one to five or two to six, I think, I can't remember, or two to five, uh, for, for an extended summer surface temperature, basically. And there's two regions where supposedly this version of the presses did uh, a better job than the initialized, the North Atlantic, the tropical Pacific. Uh, and so as many of you guys know, I, or many of you guys who know me know, I'm, I'm never that keen on skill scores themselves. I always think that the key thing, if you're gonna calculate a skill score, you want to find out whether, you, whether the reason you have improved skill is, is robust mechanisms. And so this is what I've been focusing on in the last few years. A lot of this skill in this version of the process comes from capturing shifts in the subpolar gyre. So Doug talked about this the other day as well. So this is just, this just shows the, uh, in black here, the observations of subpolar gyre heat content. So it cooled from the 60s to the mid 90s. You get this very rapid warming. The uninitialized runs here just warm and they don't catch this, 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 this very rapid uh, warming here. And this, we've related this a lot, and other people too, Steve and, and Rim, to kind of changes in the ocean circulation, increasing the northward heat transport. And if you, if you predict this, you also get, uh, uh, you apparently get some extra predictability over land, maybe, if you have lots of ensemble members. The other thing is, so this, this skill here, this isn't just ENSO uh, in this original version of, or in this version of Depressus. So what you also find is, and this relates to the pacemaker experiment. So this is a uh, difference in observed SST between uh, basically after the mid-90s warming and, and before the cold period of AMV, you see that you get this very warm Atlantic. But as we also know, we had this cooling uh, trend in the tropical Pacific, uh, this IPO type trend. Uh, what you see in this, this version of the press is if you basically take the hindcasts that w have a warm North Atlantic and those that have a cold North Atlantic, this is what happens in year one you get this warm A and V. And as you go to years two to six, what happens is you get this, this development, quite weak development of, a, of this negative IPO phase. Now the model can't hold on to this and it loses it quite quickly. And this may be related to the fact that it, that it can't hold on to these tropical North Atlantic SSTs. Uh, but there's, there's been a lot of work, and again, Yoshi has done some work on this, suggesting that if you have this warming in the, the North Atlantic, you can get this, 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 this kind of uh, teleconnection to the IPO. So there's some reason for the North Atlantic, perhaps in this prediction system, to give you some extra skill here. I never showed this, but this is for the, the, those initialized either side. But the, for the, the, the models that get set the, the biggest response in this negative IPO are the ones that are initialized around here, actually, and they, and they get a much stronger uh, response. But again, they can't hold on to it, not for, certainly not for a decade. Anyway, so there's still many questions, and these are just a few. So, so can we really trust these low-resolution models? Uh, most of the models using the decadal prediction have low-resolution atmospheres and oceans. And are we really confident about these, these upper, upper ocean heat content <laughs> is predicted? So sorry about that. Uh, and what are the key processes? And what are, what's been this role of the forcing in the most recent period? So I'm going to talk a bit about volcanoes and maybe a bit about aerosols. So as a quick outline, um, so I'm going to talk about this new newish decadal prediction system based on high gem uh, and some of the work I've been doing looking at the predictions of the North Atlantic. Uh, so some of the role of the external forcing and then, uh, and then briefly if I've got time, something about this model diversity 
Uh, and Noel just picked up on it then. And we don't really understand what the drive, well, the, what drives the North Atlantic variability in the models. So basically, what is HiGem? HiGem is a high-resolution version of HadGem One. That's the model that came after HadCM3, but before the most recent version of the uh, of the MetOffice model, HadGem3. It was developed jointly between academia in the UK and the MetOffice. Uh, it's got a one-third degree ocean, uh, uh, so it's roughly eddy permitting and a 90 kilometer atmosphere. Uh, it doesn't resolve the stratosphere. It has a lid at, at one hectopascal. Um, and so basically, what we wanted to do was to have a very high, uh, well, a high resolution model, which was initialized in a very similar way to HadCM3. So the initial states were almost identical, essentially. So we, we, we have uh, 3D temperature and salinity anomalies uh, are simulated by, by nudging. Uh, it's a 15 day relaxation time. We use Doug's ocean analysis. The climatological period is a bit different, uh, maybe come to that later. And we have the minimum CMIP5 set. And so this just shows the difference in ocean resolution. This is just a snapshot in SST from January 1st in had CM3 and then high gem. So you can see here high gem, you know, captures much better the, the Gulf Stream, et cetera, and the, the gradients, the SST gradients are, 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 are stronger. So this may give you improved predictions. So how do we do for skill? So this is surface air temperature skill. Uh, for the high gem, the 10 CMIP5 start dates. Um, and for year, uh, lead one, two to three, four to six, uh, seven to 10. Uh, and basically these look like most of the models essentially that submitted to the CMIP5. You've got good skill everywhere. Uh, the, uh, the Pacific's not doing so well, but that's, that's standard across the models. And now if we go to the, the impact of initialization, so this is the correlation skill of the initialized forecast minus the transient runs. I should have said that. We've got four transient runs, historically forced transient runs. Uh, and the main thing I want to point out is that, so, it, uh, well, two things. It's shortly times the main skill improvement is in the uh, subpolar gyre and then maybe a bit in the, in the Pacific, although note that we don't have very good skill in the Pacific overall, but we're still improving slightly, make things less worse. Uh, but as we go to longer lead times, years four to six and seven to ten, what really stands out is this improvement in the North Atlantic. So we have a big improvement in the subpolar gyre, and then we have this nice improvement of skill reaching down into the tropical North Atlantic. Everyone knows this is kind of the kind of nice comma shape of the of, of what we think the AMV is. Uh, so so yeah, we were pretty pleased uh, with the skill. And. Long story short, essentially, that a lot of this skill in the North Atlantic comes from the predictions of a subpolar gyre. So I'm not going to go into this in too, too much detail, uh, just because a lot of people have covered this before, uh, including us and, and Stephen Rim, obviously. But essentially, this plot here is similar to one I showed before from Hadzian 3. The black line is the observations, exactly the same as before. The blue line here is the smooth transit runs. Because we've only got four transit runs, uh, I've smoothed them just because they're a bit noisy. And then this is the the two sigma spread of the, of, the, of the transient runs. And then if you can see this, this is our 10 start dates essentially, our CMIP5 start dates. Uh, and so what you get in the 60s is you get a nice uh, cooling of the subpolar gyre. In the, in the early 90s, so this is 90 and 95, you predict the warming of the subpolar gyre. Uh, uh, and one of, this is the 2005 up here, and it predicts this slight cooling of a subpolar gyre, which is similar to what the Met Office has shown in Leon's paper uh, yeah, in, the, in their systems. So, so yeah, so HiGem does a good job, basically. So, so, this, so the predictability of subpolar gyre is consistent across models, essentially, using almost exactly the same initial state. And of course, this is, this is largely related to what we're, what we're initializing in the deep North Atlantic, in particular in the Labrador Sea. So a couple of people have shown this plot. This shows the density anomalies in the deep Labrador Sea from the observations. Uh, and it shows that they've gone through kind of a multi-decade variability of being low in the 60s, spinning up to this, or, well, increasing into the mid-90s, which a, a few of us have linked to this kind of persistent NAO forcing, increasing the deep convection, and increasing the density in the Labrador Sea. And then since the mid-90s, you've had this this relaxation of the Labrador Sea to, uh, to very low values. And now this plot here is the, how density leads a reduction in the MO, MOC from high gem, basically. 
So what, so this, so basically if you initialize density here, you change the MOC and you change the northward heat transport and that's essentially what's going on in high gem. Uh, I'm not gonna show you all the diagnostics of that, uh, but that's, so you have to take my word for it, but that's essentially what's going on. So one of the cool things about high gem is that uh, the Met Office models, or at least the old Met Office ocean model, had, uh, you could output the, the heat budget terms on each grid point and it calculates them at a time step basis, basically. So before we could only validate the 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 whole column heat budget of the of the of the subpolar gyre validated against the whole, well, across the whole basin. Whereas now we can focus on much smaller regions. We can look at the upper ocean, and so this is the heat budget for the top 500 meters in one of the hindcasts, uh, 1995. And so essentially on on this plot, what I'm showing in the solid lines is the different uh, contributions to the subpolar gyre, which uh, itself, in the top 500 meters. Uh, the, the black line is the net ocean uh, heat budget uh, change, the, the change in the energy. Excuse me, what's the x-axis? The x-axis is months, yeah. yeah. Months. months. yeah, so it's initialized, so yeah, it's just forecast months. So it's initialized on the 1st of November, and 1995, so that's the 1st of November, 96, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, so the subpolar gyre warms. So I showed you that on the previous one. And in this, in this, in this uh, run, this is largely due to the ocean advection term. So this is this blue line here. So it completely dominates this warming of the subpolar gyre in high gem. The, the purple line here is the surface fluxes. So they're, they're slightly positive, so they're contributing. And then there's a, there's a, a big, well, not big, there's a cooling term from the convection, uh, which is, well, I'll talk about it in a minute. The, these dash lines are the, from the transit run. So the transit run doesn't really warm. The black line here is the net. Uh, and so you can see at this time, you gain a lot from initializing the ocean state, initializing this increased northward heat transport. So you can also do this regionally. So this is just over the whole, basically integrating the fluxes over the whole length of the hindcast, so the full 10 years. This is the change in the upper 500 meter heat content in this run. So you see this big warming in the subpolar gyre. And this, in the eastern subpolar gyre, is dominated by the ocean advection. What's interesting is in the western subpolar gyre, it's the surface fluxes themselves that, that are uh, playing an important role. And they're partially balanced by this, this convection term. And this is essentially a total shutdown of the deep convection at this time, which, which we know happened in the, in the real world. So these two balance out, and you get a, a, a moderate warming in the, in the western subpolar gyre. And then ice is adding a warming up here because you get less ice export into the subpolar gyre at this time. So is this a budget prediction or a hindcast? Uh, of the hindcast, so for, of the 95 hindcast, yeah. So the budget is just the 1995 yeah. retrospective forecast? Yeah. Yeah. So things aren't all rosy uh, in high gem. So this is the overturning strength. Uh, the black is the assimilation, and we see this, this decrease. In the AMOC in the 60s, this steady increase towards the mid-90s and then a slowdown uh, since the mid-90s. The blue line here is the transit runs, and essentially these red lines are the, the, the initialized runs, and we've got a pretty nasty state-dependent drift, basically. In the 60s, uh, these runs just really want to be much stronger uh, up to the transit runs, and they just spin up constantly, essentially. So if I, I didn't point this out, but if, if you look at this 1965 run, you see a very sudden cooling and then it, it actually ends up up here again. So this is from this, this bit long time, this very large spin-up of the overturning. Um, so initializing the AMOC uh, remains to be a challenge in these models, uh, obviously, and that's not necessarily surprising, I guess. Um, yeah, and I think this is related to the climatological period, just because our climatological period in high gem is here, basically. So we're, we're putting in very strong anomalies back here at depth, which the model's rejecting, essentially. Um, so, previously I've looked quite a lot at the, this climate impact, so the surface uh, fields. Uh, it's quite hard in high gem because we have so few members, and especially for the transient runs, because we've only got four. Uh, so it's, it's pretty hard to find things, but one of the strongest signals, which is uh, quite interesting, is that what I didn't say is that actually we've done hindcasts from, from every year from 1990 to 1995. If you look at them, what you see in, in the first five years is they, they, they predict quite a strong positive NEA. 
Uh, and if you look at what happened in the observations, which is here, so it doesn't quite match up, but the observations, this is a bit of a weird period, but it's essentially years one to five from these hindcasts. The NAO was quite positive here and then weakened in the observations. Um, you kind of get that in the high gem, so this is the difference over these two periods, but that's essentially because you've got a very strong positive NAO. So that's quite interesting. That, and that, we don't know, I obviously don't know what, exactly why that is, um, but it could be related to the, the SST gradient at that time, because you have very cold sub and a very warm uh, Gulf Stream. So that's what's in these predictions. Um, okay, so that's, that's the kind of North Atlantic part. So on to the impact of Pinatubo. So I've rerun this 1990 hindcast, uh, now holding volcanic stratospheric aerosol constant. So I haven't done anything about the ozone at this point. And essentially in high gem we have four latitudinal bands, uh, and I've just held that at constant value from just previous to the Pinatubo eruption. So it doesn't go to zero, it just holds constant. Uh, and I've increased the ensemble size to eight, uh, eight members. And basically, this is just for the subpelagia. Um, and the red is the volcano, purple is the no volcano, and there's not a lot of impact. There's a small impact, but it's not significant. So this would suggest, in high gem, <laughs> that Pinatubo, well, the sub warming w would have happened whether Pinatubo would have gone off or not. That's, uh, Pinatubo does have a bigger impact elsewhere, obviously. So this, this is year one, year two, year three. So this is actually 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96. Uh, and what you see, obviously, in year two, you see some big regional coolings that hang around to year three. Uh, so across North America and Europe, in particular in Africa. Uh, these kind of disappear in years four and five. And what's interesting, you see a big return of this cold anomaly across uh, Europe in year six uh, and some warming up here. And that's essentially, seems to be, because in the volcano run uh, in 1996, the winter of 95, 96, uh, the run with a volcano captures a very negative NAO, um, which is also what happened in the real world. Now, of course, this is only eight members, um, and it could all just be a, a complete fluke. Um, so I haven't had time to look at whether there's any meaningful memory in the system, um, but that's one of the things, obviously, to look at. Uh, so obviously, Leon showed that uh, changes in salinity could affect changes, and I haven't looked at anything like this, basically. <coughs> but yeah, so that's just the flavor of what we've done in high gem. Also note that, of course, so this, this is significant at the 1% at the, at the level, but there's also a, a negative NAO here, which isn't quite significant, but um, so it could all just be chance. Um, yeah, and then finally, this is the impact on sea ice. Um, so in year six, you start to get these big sea ice anomalies it, uh, up here in the northern Gin Sea, and then these last persist for the first few years, uh, but not the first few years, for the next few years. And again, these could just be consistent with a big random negative NEO, which has nothing to do with a volcano, but so there's, there's some hint that there may be some memory here, but I haven't explored it yet. Um, now, this, this is actually really uh, stupid, so uh, you might want to <laughs> totally ignore this. Uh, but so in high gem, we have this very interesting sensitivity experiment where we have uh, two times the anthropogenic SO2 emissions. <laughs> um, so, uh, so in all of the hindcasts, in our original set, we, we had twice the aerosol emissions. So just as a bit of a noddy exercise, I decided to have a comparison, see whether these have an impact in hydrogen. So this is, this is what you've shown before. This is just for reference. This is the initialized predictions with the correct aerosol emissions minus the two times uh, aerosol emissions. And what you see is that if you get the right aerosol emissions, that you get better skill in the first few years. It's a bit patchy. Um, but in general, it's, it's an improvement. Uh, but what... What's interesting here is that the, the skill in this improvement in the North Atlantic is not sensitive to the aerosol emissions. Cheers, Doug. Um, so make of that what you will. But uh, so, yeah, so the, the, the skill, the capturing of this North Atlantic warming in this 
this improved prediction of the tropical North Atlantic temperatures in high gem has nothing to do with the aerosols, essentially. So finally, in my last couple of minutes, I just want to talk about uh, some recent work which a, a PhD student of uh, mine in Rowan's has been doing. So Matt Menery, some of you will know him from the Met Office. Uh, he got very interested in what controls multi-decadal variability in different models, essentially. So some of them, in general, have mechanisms which are more related to temperature variability and some are more salinity variability. But of course, one of the things is, and I think I'm putting this in here because this is, has application to not just prediction, uh, but also to these pacemaker experiments, perhaps, and also the forced response, actually. So the, this is the, all of the CMIT-5 models. In the subpelagia, the, what you will, will be able to see is the contours, the colors, which is the, the, the heat content bias in all of these models. There is salinity in here, which is contoured as well. So basically, the point is that there's huge diversity in model biases. Uh, you get cold and fresh, warm and salty, some in between. Um, and what this means is you get big spread diversity in the density in this region. Now, all of us know this, so this is just hammering home a point that we know, but trying to quantify it. This is all of these models uh, in terms of their, uh, their salinity and temperature bias. And what you find is that, there's, uh, that, that they correlate in terms of their, so they compensate in terms of their bias in terms of salinity and temperature. So they're either warm and salty or cold and fresh, generally speaking. Matt's also looked at their effective resolution, which is their, their, he's counted the amount of grid cells within the subpolar gyre itself. So it's the actual regional uh, resolution. And what you tend to find, generally, is the high resolution models are warm and, warm and salty, and the lower resolution models tend to be cold and fresh. And then if you look at what these plots here show you what essentially what controls density in the upper ocean of the Labrador Sea, which is normally important across all of these mechanisms, you find that, again, strong correlations between the temperature bias and the salinity bias with what, so basically the cold and fresh models are generally salinity controlled, and the warm and salty models are generally temperature controlled. Now, again, this kind of makes sense because it's just the nonlinear equation of state. It's not surprising, but it's just hammering home. We've got this huge diversity. The, first, the last thing to say here is that the, these ellipses show the model's uh, standard deviations, so uh, at annual mean standard deviations. So there's, they don't overlap at all. The, you know, they're huge biases. Uh, and then one final plot before Doug throws me off. So there's, there's no systematic relationship between these biases and what controls the density with the spectral uh, characteristics of Atlantic variability in these models. So the time scale, the magnitude. But what we do find is a weak relationship between the spatial pattern of the mechanism. So this, this plot basically just shows where the models uh, opposite correlation. So when you've got a certain anomaly in the Labrador Sea where the opposite relationship is in temperature uh, yeah, temperature. And what you find is, is that the low resolution models tend, to, when they have a, 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 a dense Labrador seed, tend to have their warming down here. And the low resolution models tend to have their, well, these low resolution models tend to have some sort of a adjustment up here. So it just means that in terms of prediction, if you initialize the same temperature and salinity anomaly, you're going to get, you're gonna, your models are going to predict quite a different evolution. That's, what, that's all it says. So yeah, so just in summary, we've got these high gem runs. High gem generally improves the skill in surface air temperature, SST, and approaching heat content, particularly in the North Atlantic and at longer leads. Uh, the, the 1960s and 1990s warming, uh, cooling and warming of the North Atlantic does appear to be predictable, and it's similar to previous mechanisms. Uh, yeah, uh, there's some evidence that there's some climate predictability, but it's, it's not very robust. Uh, Pinatuba does appear to have an impact, or does not appear to have an impact on the subpelagia warming itself. But obviously, it does have regional impacts, uh, which I'm investigating. And then, yeah, this last final point, there's this huge model diversity uh, in subpelagia biases, which means it's hard uh, to find a dominant driver of decadal variability. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. George, um, did you love the keto so I much. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder if your university of Wales is planning to participate in any or all of the PCPP 
performance? Uh, ye yes, in short. Uh, we, were, we are most likely to, com to contribute to component C, uh, probably on the initialized runs rather than the pacemaker runs. So, uh, so yeah, I have to check that that's okay to, to, to not give the full set. Um, there is a, an outside chance we could do component A, but um, uh, we'd need it to be a professional activity and not a lunchtime <laughs> activity. Um, yeah, it's huge, huge resources. And I think it's probably very unlikely. Yeah. Okay. I had a question and a comment. <coughs> the Hatcham 3, you, yeah. when you described it, you essentially, from your previous version, you sort of hinted at the ocean model resolution being one third the three. Yeah. But the whole system is different, probably, right? Yeah, yeah, so it's not just a resolution issue. Okay, so it's not just a... So you can't claim it's resolution. Okay, yeah. that's, uh, I just want to clarify. And then the second uh, sort of a comment, when you go into uh, Labrador C biases in yeah. terms of temperature and salinity, I'm not surprised, essentially, you are getting that uh, low res versus high res split. One reason, in my view, that's why I was trying to get the initial conditions set up properly in these senior conservations, Low resolution integrations, low resolution models tend to be integrated much longer in their pre industrial uh, simulations. Yeah. And then the 20th century start from there. And then, in this, uh, then the high resolution models, they just run for 50 years or 100, and they don't have much equilibration time. So that might be a reason, in my view, and that's why I was trying to get the CMIP models start from the same motion initial conditions, but I could not bring that out. Yep. So, yeah, so just to, you'll like this, Gokant, but the, so this, I didn't mention this, this is the observations here. Okay. And what you probably can't see is there's a cloud of models around here, which are all about one degree ocean. Uh, <laughs> so it's opposite to what I said. So, well, so kind of opposite, so it doesn't quite work. So, so, so the, if you believe this, uh, uh, at face value, then a one degree ocean is the best. Uh, I wouldn't believe that. Uh, part, <laughs> part of it is what you said. These high resolution models, these are the two highest resolution models here. These are the two new Met Office models, well, two versions of the Met Office model. Uh, they've only been run for a few hundred years. Um, and so, yeah, so in terms of tuning them, it's very difficult. I don't know how you could explain why these very low resolution models are there on that same argument. Uh, but certainly there's a, there's a physical thing and then a social thing, which is that one degree models are easier to tune. Okay, so I, I, when I was reading your maybe 2014 or 2013 paper, I can't remember, when you were looking at the heat budget of the 1995 ship. Yeah. And then in that paper, you say, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that at the long lead times, there starts to be this influence of, the, of actually the temperature dipole leading to some critical scale. Yeah. Um, so in the, in, the, in the early periods, there's the um, there's the anomaly in the trans in, in just the transport, and then there's the heat piece. It's very piece. similar in hydro. So this, okay. yeah. this this is averaged over those 95 start dates. You probably can't see this in 91. So initially, it's in the the V prime T bar, yeah. and then this this uh, this propagation at longer <coughs> lead times into the into the eastern subpolar gyres largely. Okay, so, so one thing that Brett was, I wonder about this is is there do you think that there's any small amount of, it, of skill that all groups can get just by having good yes. upper ocean heat content initialization, which is much, much easier than getting AMOC initialization, right? Yeah, yeah, essentially. So, we, so um, hopefully sometime later this year, uh, we're collecting data in specs to do a multi-model analysis of this sub gyre warming. So that's one of the things. It's, well, it won't be possible to do, to do this in terms of the breakdown. But we'll be able to look at the AMOC correlations with the heat transport, etc. So that's one of the ideas. Yeah. So you can still get skill as long as you initialize the upper ocean heat content. Yeah, I think that this was on my mind when I saw how different the AMOC states were. It made me think that there might be another more robust way of getting at least some modest critical skill. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. So I think we've had an excellent set of talks over the last three and a half days, and now we're in a great position to finalize this protocol. So we'll come back to. Yeah, the advice to do that. So let's thank everybody over the last year.